And we're live. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm just going to laugh right now. Seek, I'm so excited to have you here. We have known each other, at least online, for quite a few years. And um, talking before the show, it was really fun to hear your story. And um, Tim and I both are so thrilled um, to chat with you about your creations and your comic book history and the creativity that you're involved with. So welcome to our show. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit giddy because this is really fun to have someone who has their whole background full of comic book toys and we can talk about Neverland. <laughs> oh yeah, that would be great. Uh, and, thanks for having me, by the way. Thank you. Of course, of course. Um, your name. Let's talk about your name because I know sometimes you get questions. Um, yeah. It's pronounced Seek. Yeah, Seek. Yeah, yeah with like a, with, with an S, like hide and go Seek. Exactly. Yeah. Tell us um, a little bit about your name and, and your backstory there. Um, well, well, I actually don't remember. Uh, uh, so in, um, in 2010, um, I had a brain aneurysm rupture yeah. and, uh, and I was recovering from that. And I guess it was um, a nickname that a, a friend called me. And so, uh, so he, so that was the first name I had heard post aneurysm and I was struggling with memory and um, I had sometimes the left side of my body, like sometimes I, like my arm and shoulder, sometimes hard to move. And he called me Seek. And so I, at, that was the first name I heard, but that's not my legal name. So um, we made it my legal name like a little while later, like a year and a half later. Um, uh, Donnelly is my mother's last name. So I figured since I kind of came out through this event as a kind of a different, somewhat of a different person, um, I would just take that name. So I have both legal names, but so Seek kind of comes from a nickname, and but I don't remember the origin of the nickname. Uh, maybe I was just good at the game hide and go seek. I don't know. <laughs> I, like, I like the name. I thought it was, uh, I, my, my mom said it's because I, I sought or seeked my way back. You know, is, is kind mm. of so. Yeah, I don't always like the name. Yeah, that sounds yeah. appropriate. Hi, Chiama. We'll have some friends pop on and and say hi. Um, what's fascinating is after you came. I mean, your whole story is fascinating. But after your brain aneurysm, you had a collaboration on a comic book, which I actually bought, and I so wish I could bring it here to show everyone because it's just so phenomenal. And you named some collaborator collaborators such as Kevin Eastman, who comic book followers, Tim, I don't know if you know who Kevin Eastman is. <laughs> okay. uh, tell me who he wrote. Uh, that's probably Teenage the... Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, what, what that's does it after mean? My, that's after my time, unfortunately. Cowabunga <laughs> dude. Is that, is that that's his? That's how old I am. So. <laughs> Cowabunga do, dude. Yeah. Is, is that what they yeah. say? Oh yeah. yeah. Cowabunga. That's Michelangelo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so he was one of the collaborators. Will you tell us about that comic book? And like I said, I bought it. It's brilliant. And I believe you won some kind of awards because it was such a big collaboration. But tell us about that. Um, well, uh, at that time, I had met a guy in here in Florida named Gene, who is also now uh, we were friends for five years, and then he also had a brain aneurysm rupture. So uh, we're best friends, and he he was like, hey, have you ever thought about making a comic? And I said, well, yeah, before my aneurysm, I was working in comics, and I had to finish a book called Heaven's Echo Post Aneurysm, and there was still like, I don't know, like 10 chapters left to write, and I didn't remember ever working on it, and I had to finish it. And... Um, Needless to say, the book sucks, <laughs> and so I, I wasn't sure if I, if writing was a good career move because I didn't really remember all those years of working hard at trying to get there. Um, I just remembered working in television production as like a PA and stuff, so I was trying to lean back into that. Um, and but I met this guy Gene online, and he was like, "Dude, we got to work on something together." So I had at that point made some contacts at DC Comics. And I had pitched them an idea for a Superman story. And I was hoping that we could do a Superman book 
that would help raise awareness for brain aneurysms. But DC was already doing things in the Horn of Africa at that time, and uh, they were doing a thing called We Can Be Heroes. So the, I guess they couldn't do the charity or do two at once or, or you know, whatever. So uh, a guy named Rich Johnson at Bleeding Cool had kind of wisely said to me, um, hey, why don't you just make your own character up? <laughs> and so we came up with Soul Star uh, because I want, I've always loved Japanese uh, culture and history. And I had like a bunch of notebooks on things that I was researching for a different story. And I said, hey, why don't we use these old notes from my old life about learning about Japan and add it to this guy. And the big thing I wanted to do was I wanted to write a story where you always get origin stories of superheroes, but I wanted to write a story where you saw the last day of their life and yeah. what did they do on their last day. And um, especially when they're the only superhero in the world and they've spent years accumulating all these supervillains. So he spends his last day trying to turn at least one of his villains into a hero. Um, so that way the world still has someone to protect it afterwards. Um, and every page of it was drawn by a different person because I used to draw before my aneurysm and I'm, it's, I can do it now, but it's hard, um, a lot harder than it was. So we reached out to just, we went down Artist Alley and just made friends and met artists and said, well, here's our project. And I made little pamphlets and we brought them around and showed them. And, and I said, here's my, e it has my email on it. If you're interested, email me and I'd love to get you on it. And then, yeah, eventually it, it uh, because of uh, Golden Apple Comics, which is where I was working at the time, the owner of it knew Kevin Eastman and was like, hey, would you do a cover for this for this kid's book? And not only did Kevin do one cover, but he let me draw the pencils of a second cover and he inked over it. Uh, so we, I literally got to collaborate with, you know, a childhood hero of mine. My mom was like, Ninja Turtles and Transformers. When you were a kid, those were your things. And here I was with, you know, the artist who created the, the Ninja Turtles doing a cover together. And it, it was a, it was amazing. It was a dream come true. And our goal was to raise awareness and, and, and try to get the word out there. And we almost won an award. We almost won most comic artists on a single comic book. Uh, we had 150 artists on the book. But I think right as we were submitting that, another book came out that had like 175 or something. So we didn't quite win the uh, Guinness Book of World Record, but it was close. And uh, and it was I was like, oh, so close. That would have helped us just get more awareness out there, which was my yeah. goal. Yeah. Um, but uh, in some ways, that book was a success. In other ways, it was a, a kind of a failure, too. And so I, I try to have been learning from that experience ever since. And that's why I'm trying to do better with like stuff like Neverland, you know. Mm. If if our friends wanted to find it, because I know I went and looked for it, I think. I don't remember where I found it, but if our friends wanted to find that comic book, which I think is quite a brilliant idea, where could we find it? Do you know? Uh, Soul Star, I think, is only on Amazon. Um, okay. I self-published it, and I just signed up for Amazon Smile or whatever it was. So, like, I pretty much just try to give the money to the Aneurysm Foundation, like, pennies at a time, you know? Uh, yeah. Or I, I accumulate it to, like, when it hits $50, and then I do a donation. So, so yeah, every sale helps towards that yeah wonderful tell me um, you take over if you don't ask <laughs> no, I was just wondering, i've got loads of, loads of possible questions i'm just wondering <laughs> just um you're you, you run this youtube channel which i think is fairly popular called the venom vlog um why venom as a character what what was the reason for picking venom and not say iron man or <laughs> or yeah. ninja turtle vlog or something like that um, well, I guess I'm a big Tom Hardy fan. Yeah. So my first episode was just watching a video where he was working out to get the role of Venom. Um, and I honestly thought like most things I work on, I'll either give up on it because I, I struggle with creating things or, um, or I have, um, like some kind of block, you know, like, a. So I, I thought it was going to be something that would just die after five episodes, maybe. Uh, but but surprisingly, it was the one thing I did on my channel that it brought people to it. Like I, I did a lot of reviews of toys and movies before, but that would bring people in, you know, two at a time, three at a time. Yeah. Then vlog was bringing people in 20, 30, 40 at a mm -hmm. time. And I, I was surprised by that. So I guess I kind of just was like, well, let's lean into it. 
and we at first we were just going to cover the movie and then i let, started going well let's i know the character but i don't know him that well like not as well as the people in the, the chat so why not um learn more about him so now we've done 600 episodes of the guy and in three and a half years and we've gone through almost all of his 30 years of comic history and i would say it was probably perfect because obviously after health issues um i started having you know um like mental uh, struggles and and depression and things like that and i think that led me down a dark road that um where i try to take my own life and mm. then i saw that venom also tried to do that in the comics eddie brock had tried to take his own life when he hit this massive low and it made me connect, I think, with the character in a way that I wasn't expecting. So that made me just want to go further and further. And so, um, you know, the show will probably end one day, but um, it's been a fun exploration of the character because it also has helped explore myself and maybe why I felt those feelings. And then it also, you know, I put links in all my videos to the AFSP and all these different groups that like reach out and help people in need like that. And, I think the show kind of took a, a different life than I intended it to. And I think that's why it lasted as long as it did and why I haven't given up on it because I feel like a lot of people give up on Eddie Brock and I didn't mm. want to be one of those people that also gave up on him. Mm. Yeah. I actually watched the film for research purposes at the weekend. The funny thing is, like at the start of it, I was thinking this isn't a very good film, but actually by the end of it, I loved it. Um, so... It's kind of, I think it is Tom Hardy's performance that really it makes is. that film. Um, oh, yeah. It's a lot of, lot of plot holes and a lot of things that aren't necessarily yeah. great in it, but it's just that whole Tom Hardy performance is brilliant. And uh, the whole I, kind of that thing where Venom says, well, I'm a loser too, so we might as well both be losers together. <laughs> so yeah. Which I thought yeah. was really funny. It's a simple explanation, but it's, uh, it's one that, like, yeah, that movie is, you know, because everyone, I think, was like, "Oh, you do the Venom blog? You must that must be your favorite movie." I'm like, "Well, no, of course it's not my favorite movie." Uh, <laughs> but uh, but Tom Hardy, I I don't think I look at Eddie Brock like I said, he's this guy that I feel like a lot of people give up on. But Tom Hardy took that role because of his son likes Venom, and yeah. I thought that was really sweet uh, that he did that, and uh, so his son can walk around and say, "Yeah, my dad's Venom," you know, which is pretty cool, and uh, and he. He, um, I think, committed to the role in a way that I don't think any other actor would. They would just be like, eh, Venom, whatever, it's stupid, and I'm in this dumb movie with this dumb script. But I think he actually tried to really bring something to it, and that is why I think most people, their takeaway of that movie is his performance, because he yeah. commits, like he really commits to the, the character, whether he's goofy or silly or intense or, or cringy, like he commits to it, and, and it's that's more than... I think most actors would give that character. So, uh, yeah, so I enjoyed that part of the movie too. I, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, having followed you for several years now, Seek, Venom, the Venom character and the Venom history, it really has a lot of fans, committed fans. Um, oh, yeah. Fully committed. And I've kind of watched your fans a little bit comment on your, your uh, stream and uh, some of your social media. So what you've created is is brilliant. Um, and it's taught me a lot. What, what are some of the comic book characters that also inspire you? Well, I mean, uh, the opposite of Venom, I love Superman. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a big Green Lantern fan. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that might be my, fav my favorite comic book character yeah. in a lot of ways. Um, because um, what I always like about Green Lantern is that you don't have to be her, like a heroic, really good person to be a Green Lantern. You just have to have the will to keep going. And you have to have the will to overcome obstacles and your worst fears. And that's kind of what powers your ring is your willpower. And uh, so I've, I think that's incredible as far as like a, a message goes to people. Um, and yet he's probably the most made fun of superhero next to Aquaman. <laughs> at times uh uh like the lego movies love making fun of uh green lantern um but but i i think those characters are great but i like flawed characters too 
like right now I just started a, a new show, which will, when Venom Vlog ends, this, it'll probably take over Venom Vlog, um, which is the about this guy here, um, Black Adam, oh. who The Rock, the Rock is going to play in a, in a new movie for Warner Brothers. And uh, Black Adam is like the evil Shazam. But um, mm -hmm. when you learn about his history, you see that maybe he's not so evil. Like there's, there's just like um, a really rigid um, moral that he has that's a little darker than most people's morals. And uh, as The Rock says, like he would, Black Adam would like the world to be a better place, but it, until it gets there, he's got to do justice the way he sees justice uh, to be, you know. And so um, I like characters like that because I think a lot of us make mistakes in our lives, and that's why Venom's so fun to talk about in live streams, especially because he's a guy of constant mistakes, of constant failures. I always like to say that Eddie Brock was the first person in comics who got cancel cultured uh, because uh, because uh, he uh, he did a story and he didn't check his facts, and that led to a false story being printed, and that got him fired, and then that firing got him unemployed and that led to his divorce and that led to his obsession for spider-man and he went down this dark spiral that and the you know ended near depression and suicide attempt before he bounced back so i like talking about these things because i think we live in a world now where a lot of people especially when we live online now a lot of days a lot of us like myself like um it's easy to get attacked by people and uh and then that feed to your depression or feed to other things you're going through that people aren't aware of and they're just doing it because they're trolling or they're having fun or they find some tweet of yours where you, you know, you, something you stupidly said when you were 20 and that ruins your life now. And I just thought that related to Eddie. And then I thought that also related to what we're going through today. So he's been fun to talk about. I think Black Adam will be way different conversations with the live chat, uh, but, uh, but it's been fun talking about that stuff with Eddie because I have a lot of younger people that watch my show and so I'm trying to be responsible in, in how I present myself and, and the words I say um, and the topics we discuss because I don't want younger people to just think, oh, you can say and do anything really. Like I, I want people to be smart about the way they represent themselves, you know. And uh, and so it's it's been nice to to talk about that through a character with so many flaws because that's how I see myself, you know, a lot of times. Mm. So uh, I saw from the bio that Christelle nicely sent me before the show <laughs> um, that you've got a are you either is it out at the moment Neverland you you've got an, is it a novel or is it a comic book what is, um, this, ne it what was, is this project <laughs> Neverland was um it's it's just one of those things where I went through my old I, I kept a lot of journals like and I'm thankful yeah. for that because uh, now without <clears throat> with memory issues it's nice to have them sometimes. So I went through and I was looking at these journals of like what I always wanted to write or like, I guess what the previous me always wanted to write. And so I said, well, if I do give up writing, which I want to do, um, what's the last thing? What would the old me be proud of that we got out there before the end? And it, I came across this story called the, the it was called Neverland uh, something. It was like had a different title. And I was like, let's explore this because I think the concept is really good. And so I did a Kickstarter on it. And then as we were doing the Kickstarter, there was interest from a couple different places to possibly make it a movie as the Kickstarter was happening. And I said, well, let me write the book first because right now I just have like this yeah. detailed outline and everything. Then as I was writing the book, it was supposed to be just one book and a book called uh, King of Neverland side quests and it was going to feature some of the characters that didn't get a lot of screen time in the main book and it was going to flesh them out but then as we started developing that the movies people started coming back and so I started then developing it as different movie projects and then it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and luckily one of those movie projects led me to write a pilot for something else um, but uh, but then they kind of I was like, well, let me go back to basics with Neverland. So we actually, I scrapped a lot of the stuff I did and started over uh, almost completely like two and a half years ago. And now the book is almost done, but it's now it's three books. And I lost the side quest thing and filtered those moments into the main book and just did it like almost like a trilogy. So I think it's a bigger story than I intended, but um, I think it's also perfect the way it is now. 
And so now I'm just going through and fine tuning stuff and we're, and I got to write probably like uh, the rewrite the second half of the third book. Um, but that's it. So like I, I've, I'm almost done and I've been working on it and not sleeping, which is not good for me. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but I really promised I want, I, 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 I told everyone I would have it out this year and I said it at a time where I, I probably wouldn't have, but it made me work harder at it. So now it looks like I will have it done this year. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best. It, it's hard because I have trouble visualizing things, uh, which is why it's hard to draw sometimes. So um, it's hard to visualize. So writing a novel where you have to create the visuals has been the hardest thing about that book. Is, it makes it, uh, uh, you know, I can write the dialogue all day, but then mm. back and filling in things. It's like just been the most time consuming part of it. Yeah. yeah so, so it'll come out. It's a, a, the story is uh, I came up with this idea that I'm like, I always wondered how if, if Neverland is a place for kids that never grow up, how are there adults there? So I came up with a story where there's a curse in Neverland. If you're a, a kid and you kill in Neverland, you become an adult mm. um and um and so peter pan kills captain hook and then becomes the new hook in a way and so he's uh he, but he doesn't want to be captain he's he calls himself the king of neverland and his goal is he wants his friends to join him so he's trying to get the lost boys to kill the other pirates so that they'll grow up with him so he's not by himself you know and, uh, and so it's a kind of a darker take on Peter Pan, but Peter Pan's always been like this selfish brat. So I kind of yeah. like exploring that in an adult version of him. And then the, the Lost Boys are like, well, we need to go get Wendy because if we bring her here, that might be, it might awaken, it, we might be able to stop what's happening to Peter or he might realize that he's gone too far, you know, and that kind of stuff. Um, and they think that Wendy might be his true love. Uh, and that's why they're bringing her back to Neverland. But they they find out they're wrong, and there's there's a lot of great twists in it, and uh, and it brings back a lot yeah, of don't ruin the <laughs> yeah. I don't want to ruin it, but uh, but I do reference things from a lot of different versions of Peter Pan, like um, Rufio from Hook. Um, yeah. I've always liked that character, so uh, I do have someone uh, say Bangarang in it, uh, which is pretty fun. <laughs> That's exciting! Very exciting! I'm so thrilled about that. They they say Bangarang right before they beat the crap out of Peter Pan. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so I hope you guys like it. I I'll let you know when it comes out because I'm just going to probably release that on Amazon also. So um, I'll let you know when it comes out. Yes. Right. We'll, we'll have to talk talk to him again, Tim, because I want to hear all about. Yeah. yeah no. can, when it's out, we'll, we'll, we'll get you back. Here, yeah. You'll see some um, some documentary things. A friend of mine who's like a, like a filmmaker here, he wants to He's going to film me going to the printers and, and uh, talking about the characters. So when the book comes out, you're going to see a bunch of special features on the, my YouTube channel for that book. Uh, mm -hmm. that'll, that'll be in-depth discussions on everything. I think I planned like 30 videos. So you'll see a lot of stuff coming up. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to, I was like, uh, we, me and Crystal are both competing for questions. Usually it's like there's a big silence. You are, we're like <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we're like, no, we both want to ask a question. Uh, if, like, talking about films, like, if, um, well, we'll say the MCU because I know more about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But if they said to you, you can write the script for one Marvel film, what characters would you like and villains would you like to have in that film? You can have any of them. I mean, uh, don't have some sort of secret wars scenario where everybody in the entire universe is in. But what what Marvel characters would you put into a film if you could uh, if you had carte blanche to to make a Marvel film? Well, my favorite Marvel character is Doctor Doom, so I would probably love to do something with the Fantastic Four. Mm -hmm. um, but I also am a big fan of characters that spin out of the Fantastic Four, which are called the Inhumans. And I've never seen the show, and I refuse to watch it, uh, even though it has Anson Mount in it, who's fantastic. Uh, but uh, but I have an Inhumans tattoo for Black Bolt, yeah. um, which is the character he plays. And uh, I've always loved those characters um, because of, you know, they live on the dark side of the moon, which I think is really cool. 
and uh, and they kind of separate from humanity, even though they're they started out as humans. So um, something with them would be really cool. Um, obviously, I love the X Men, but I, I like personal stories. Typically, I'm not the guy to write big crossovers. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm definitely the guy who writes more intimate things. I, I like to do one and done stories a lot of times. So something like a Logan or something like that. Like I, I feel like that's probably a more cut from that cloth than I am like a big budget thing. So um, so it would be tough. I don't know. I, I don't. It would be hard to pick. Uh, I would say if you gave me, I love a character in Spider Man called the Slingers. Um, and it's like these four kids who um, Spider-Man at one point was framed for murder, and then he um, he like uh, came up with four alternative identities to be in until he cleared his uh, you know proved his innocence, and then he went back to being Spider-Man. So these four teenagers take up those four costumes and kind of become a group, a team group called the Slingers. Um, I would kill to write that movie. <laughs> I would write. <laughs> Uh, I would have a lot of fun with that movie, I think. So yeah, that's that's what I would do with Slingers. Yeah. That's so cool. My my boyfriend actually popped on and he said in our comments, this is so interesting. One of my ancestors, R. M. Ballantyne, um, inspired J. M. Barry, who wrote the original Peter Pan book. Oh awesome. That so awesome. James James like Tim is in the UK. Um awesome. And we need to get James on the show. You can't keep like uh, avoiding coming on the show. You got interview, especially now that he, we know that he's like uh, one of his ancestors wrote something that inspired the person who wrote Pete Pan. Yes. So. Well, your ancestor inspired me then. Look at that. That's, awesome. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's so fun. Um, Seek, can you show us a couple of your toys? Because I'm looking behind you and I'm. I, I don't know how much you follow what I say, but I'm super ADHD and I keep looking at all the toys behind you. So yeah. sh can you show us some of your collection, maybe a couple of your favorites? Sure, well, I'll start with the Green Lantern battery. Uh, this is actually just a cheap $20 piggy bank, but I've been carrying it around for a few years getting autographs on it. So I actually have Henry Cavill sign this. Um, mm -hmm. Ben Affleck signed it. Yeah. Um, some of the other members of the Justice League, Ezra Miller, um, and then I also had people from the animated universe uh, sign this too, Sam Liu, Brennan Vietti. So I really love, oh, there's Sam's, uh, I love having that. Um, and then I love, uh, actually, we talked about Todd McFarlane before the stream. Um, he's, him and Archie Goodwin, I think, are they're my two mentors in comics that I I never really worked under, but I've learned everything I know about writing and storytelling comes from them in some way. And um, one of them is Spawn. So this was a Kickstarter that was last year um, that I bought myself for my birthday. Um, and it, it came in uh, just uh, like a week ago. And uh, and th these figures are amazing. They're, they're, the, there's like real metal chains on them. I, ha I put the human head of Spawn on there, Al Simmons. So... Um, you know, and it, it's funny because I see a lot of, I have every issue of Spawn, all 316 of them uh, that are out currently. Um, and it's so funny to see people react to Spawn now and they go, wait, Spawn's a black guy? And I'm like, yeah, Spawn's a black guy. Like, <laughs> like, and he's cool. And he's like, he works for the government and he, um, he like uh, was a spy who like um, turned, uh, you know, uh, against um war like he wanted he settled down he met someone that he fell in love with and uh, named wanda and he wanted to settle down with her so he was willing to walk away and because you can't just walk away from the line of work he was in uh his you know his uh team like killed him um and then he went to hell because he spent a whole life killing people and uh while he was in hell he made a deal with the devil that he would come back to earth um in exchange for leaving hell's army on earth when the time was right so he comes back to Earth and he's thinking he can see his wife again. But five years has passed and she's married to somebody else. And they have like a three year old kid together and his face is burnt. So she can't recognize him. And uh, and so he obviously like any deal with the devil, he got screwed. <laughs> and so, mm. so I always love that, though, because I always love McFarlane saying like, you know, every everyone who's good has a germ of evil in them and everyone who's evil has a germ of good in them. And I, I've always liked that. So he's like, so just because Al spent a lifetime of killing, 
that germ of good was willing to walk away and be in love and, and settle down with somebody and start a new life, but he never got that opportunity. And I'm like, that's that helps me want to give people second chances a lot more thinking of that. So I love Spawn. I have his stuff. Um, obviously, uh, Venom. I'm a big fan of Venom. So I have a nice Venom yeah. statue here. Um, actually, my one of my favorite movies, it might surprise a lot of people, um, is uh, The Predator. Uh, the original one. Uh, so I have some. I thought you were going to say how the duck there. <laughs> yeah, how the duck. Um, so Predator, I love. So I, my brother bought me these, and I never even opened them. I, I like them so much. So they're yeah. in the box still. Um, and then on this side, we'll do a little uh, McFarland. More McFarland. This this whole shelf is all McFarland stuff. This is Bane, uh, played by Tom Hardy in the movie. But this is him yeah. with the scarecrow stuck on his back. Um, yeah. And he's got a scarecrow has no legs. <laughs> uh, so it's like just creepy versions of these characters that McFarlane has made. I have Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, uh, Batman on a motorcycle that's made out of bat bones. Um, mm. Yeah, there's just all these crazy things. I even have a Yellow Lantern Predator uh, <laughs> from the Green Lantern universe. So, uh, and then that whole corner over there, you, can, you can't see past the Venom blog sign. But there's a whole shelf over there all full of Halo stuff. Um, uh -huh. So I'm a big uh, fan of the video game Halo as well. Yeah. Okay, so I think we could have spent all day just looking at your collection of uh, yeah, figures yeah. behind you. For you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, haven't got, we haven't got a three-hour stream limit on <laughs> I always love that Nick, I think it's Nick Swartzman, he had a joke where he said his nephew would come up to him and say, hey, here's this toy, and he does this, and here's this toy, and he does this, and here's this toy, and and so he goes, all right, nephew, come here. And he goes, so here's shampoo. It does this. And here's conditioner. And it does this. And he goes, see how that feels? <laughs> that's so funny. But with each collection is a story. And that's what's fascinating about, about your collection. And you dig into the stories. And this is something that goes along with comic books um, that you really bring out in what you do seek. And that there's such deep meaning in, in comic books and the brilliance and creativity it takes to create a comic book. Um, I think there's some false stereotypes out there that you just throw together a comic book and that's it. Yeah. But the brilliance and creativity and the actual genius behind creating a comic book and a comic book series and digging into the characters is what I find so fascinating and what you've done is bring out um, like you said, there's a dark side to everyone. There's a good side to everyone. And that's that's part of what what teaches us all about humanity and what humanity is is about. I want to ask you one last thing. Um, you're so inspiring to younger generations and people in general. Um, in the midst of COVID and world phenomenons happening right now, can you give us a little bit of hope? Um, advice, wisdom for for kids. Talk to talk to my son who's fourteen and just kind of looks up to comic book creators. What is some wisdom and advice that you might have for for uh, comic book um, people people who look up to comic book creators? You know, I, I made a book called Alon Vital that deals with the only advice I can give to people really, which is um, learn learn to be patient with people and listen. Um, I think most people struggle with the most in the world is trying to be heard in some way. They want they want to say something, whether it's something you agree with or don't agree with. They do, though. They Everyone wants to just talk. They just talk, 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 get it out, get it out, get it all out. So there are times where we should be like that because we have something to say, but there are times where we should know when to listen. And I think the best advice I can give is like I watch YouTube a lot and the reason I do is because I like to watch people who typically don't agree with me on things um, because I think it helps me work on my patience of listening to someone make their point uh, without interrupting them you know um, and and I think that's the biggest thing is I I see the center of all of our problems communication every job I've ever worked Every uh, in the past 10 years uh, that struggled or there was like, uh, you know, drama there or whatever, like whatever the issue was at the workplace it was, or if something wasn't get, getting done, 
it was always came down to communication. And I realized that that has become our number one problem in society is we've kind of given into Babel in a way. And so I, I think if you're out there and you're young, you read comics because it helped my vocabulary a ton. Mm. Um, you know, it helped me um, make friends. Uh, you know, comic books was my gateway into a lot of very important social growing things in my life. But it also showed me that people do make mistakes. Uh, when you read a comic, don't hate it just because Spider-Man does something in there you disagree with. Understand that Spider-Man is in a situation that is impossible and that that was the best option he thought he could you know, do to get through it. But he'll probably regret it later. And that's part of life. It's OK to make mistakes. Um, you're you're human. Like, I think a lot of times we forget that we aren't supposed to be these all knowing beings like we, we just have to be ourselves and do our best. And as long as you keep trying to do your best people can't really fault you for it. And if they try to just brush them off because you're like, Hey, I did my best. You know, what do you want from me? I'll do better next time. It's a learning experience. So don't be afraid to fail. And when you do fail, just process that and look at it and, and use it as a, a trampoline to jump further towards success next time. Uh, that's, that's just the best you can do is, is just keep trying your best and, and listen and be patient. And I, I think you'll be, you'll be just fine. Well, on that note, I think uh, I want to thank you for being a guest on the show yeah, and uh, say say thanks to all the people who commented. So that's yeah. Jane and Shima. Um, and probably some other people lurking, watching, and all the people who watch the replays and all the rest of the stuff. Um, and uh, yes, I'm going to play the outro now. <laughs> I don't know why I have to say I'm going to play the outro before I play the outro. <laughs> um, I'm going to play the outro. Thank you, Steve. This is um, terrifying for me. I've made more money in the last three years than I did in the previous.